Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell the person? You first, first, first. How would you tell the Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, with part 5 of my look at what might be the stupidest straw man in the history of young earth creationism by Genesis Apologetics. And that's saying something. This will be the final part of the series, so let's not stay on ceremony, let's just dive into it. There's something else that doesn't quite line up with the asteroid extinction theory. If the asteroid was responsible for the ultimate dinosaur wipeout, how did all the delicate creatures like mammals, frogs, birds, insects, fish, plants, and amphibians survive the same catastrophe? The dinosaurs and many marine reptiles were all mysteriously wiped out and fossilized while many other smaller and more environmentally sensitive animals lived? How could such an impact be powerful enough to wipe out all the tough, thick-skinned dinosaurs but leave behind the fragile, thin-skinned frogs and amphibians? The same goes for sensitive clams. That's a good question. As it turns out, the major cause of death on a global scale following the impact was not actually death from the direct blast. Relatively few creatures on a global scale would have died directly from such an event. And further, the creatures most likely to survive the direct blast would be those living underground or underwater which describes a lot of the mammals, insects, and amphibians that survived. As for the other insects and birds, well, many would be far enough away from the direct blast to survive, and then be able to fly back. The main cause of death was actually starvation, as the dust cloud from the impact would have persisted for probably months. This would mean that plants didn't get enough sunlight, and while their seeds probably could have lasted through this, in many cases the adult plants could not. This resulted in the death of most of the plants, which in turn meant herbivores could not find enough to eat, and so they died which in turn became a problem for carnivores. Now, as it turns out, during an extremely severe calorie shortage, being small is a big advantage. And one of the things you might notice is that everything that survived, with very few exceptions, was small. And the only thing that was pretty big in terms of animals that made it were crocodilians, who have the advantage of being able to go more than a year without eating in some cases. Now, do we know why in every case a certain lineage made it when others did not? No. No, we don't. But we have good ideas about it, and the pattern of survival is not surprising. Another point is that there was talk about environmentally sensitive animals like amphibians. These creatures are primarily sensitive to pollution because of their water-permeable skin, which allows environmental toxins directly into their tissues. But the problem post-impact was not primarily toxins, so this is not the kind of environmental problem that hits amphibians or fish especially hard when compared to, say, small mammals or birds. And why do the frog and clam fossils found near dinosaur fossils look the same as frogs and clams today? Well first, they don't. No Mesozoic frog or clam is in the same species as any extant one, and frogs and clams happen to be very well adapted to their habitats and lifestyles, and so they undergo only slow morphological changes in most cases. Evolution doesn't predict a uniform rate of morphological change in all lineages. Lineages with extremely well adapted or successfully generalist anatomy will show only very slow morphological change. This happens in mammals, where raccoons are morphologically very similar to the first carnivorans, simply because being a generalist omnivore who can climb trees is a pretty good gig if you can get it, and if you're adapted to it, as both raccoons today and their ancestors were. So why change? If harmful chemicals and acids can soak right through the porous skin of frogs and amphibians, and silt chokes clam gills, how did they survive and the sturdy dinosaurs perish? Already covered that. Evolutionists also believe that small rodent-like mammals that later evolved into humans also somehow survived the asteroid by crawling into holes just a few feet underground. Yeah, because that protects from both the blast and the initial short-term toxic effects. As it turns out, amphibians too can inhabit burrows. In fact, one group of them, the Sicilians, live entirely underground. And finally, let's look at the idea presented in these museums that the dinosaurs didn't really die out. They just evolved into birds. This dino-to-bird theory resurfaced in the 1960s as a rescuing device for evolution. So this has been addressed pretty well in terms of why birds are dinosaurs, and I also plan on doing some videos in the future going through the various fossils and clades getting closer and closer to crown aves. In the meantime, if you're watching this now and want my discussion on this, I suggest you watch my opening statement from my debate with Kent Hovind. But the facts show that at least 120 species of birds were living at the same time as dinosaurs. Right, because birds evolved in the mid-Jurassic as one of many lines of dinosaurs. This is just the same argument as, if humans evolved from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? The answer is that because evolution is a branching tree, when two branches split, they can both still continue to survive and evolve. Birds are but one branch of dinosaurs. 
just as humans are but one branch of monkey. Including numerous modern-looking birds like loons. Loons evolved in the Eocene. They do not live with non-avian dinosaurs. They are not found in Mesozoic rocks. Parrots. Maybe. The fossil record for parrots is spotty, and the molecular studies indicate that they could have possibly evolved around the time of the late Cretaceous. Flamingos. Flamingos evolved in the Eocene. They did not live with non-avian dinosaurs. They are not found in Mesozoic rocks. Cormorant. First, that picture was a stork, not a cormorant. Specifically, it's a juvenile brown pelican, or Pelicanus occidentalis. But yeah, there were probably cormorants in the late Cretaceous. Sandpipers. Yep, they almost certainly evolved before the KPG extinction. Owls. Owls evolved in the Paleogene. They did not live with non-avian dinosaurs. They are not found in Mesozoic rocks. Penguins. Kind of? Stem penguins had diverged from other birds by the end of the Cretaceous, but they were still flying seabirds. More like an albatross than a penguin in morphology. The waddling flightless swimmers of today are far more recent. Avocets. Well, you pronounced it wrong, but the picture helped. But avocets evolved in the Eocene. They did not live with non-avian dinosaurs. They are not found in Mesozoic rocks. Ducks and numerous waterfowl. Kind of? Waterfowl, yes, but ducks per se, no. The modern waterfowl families of Anhemidae, who are an obscure group from South America, the Anseronatidae, or magpie geese, and Anatidae, the ducks, swans, and geese, had not evolved by the end Cretaceous. Dinosaur footprints have been found right alongside bird footprints. Which wouldn't be possible in flood sediments or tsunami sediments. Go on. The fact is that birds have existed alongside land creatures since the creation week. There was no creation week and birds evolved in the Middle Jurassic. So there were a lot of animals, other dinosaurs included, who were around long before the first bird. The evidence for a worldwide flood wiping out the dinosaurs is everywhere. These evidences sure point to the rapid and widespread catastrophe of the flood. Uh, no. <laughs> but do you know what seems even more convincing? Soft tissue found in dinosaur bones. Over the last few decades, scientists have been discovering soft tissues in dinosaur bones. We're talking about over 50 peer-reviewed secular science journals that have now reported 14 bioorganic materials found in dinosaur bones. They're finding blood cells, blood vessels, connective tissue, and even collagen, which has a maximum shelf life of just tens of thousands of years, with some stretching it out to a maximum of 900,000 years. Either way, with a maximum shelf life of less than 1 million years, what's collagen doing in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? Couple things. Turns out we were wrong about the shelf life of these things. And what is being found is generally not the original molecules, but rather what's called a molecular fossil, where elements such as iron have replaced some of the original atoms in the proteins, allowing them to last much longer. But this is unusual, and was only discovered accidentally. But once the method to recover such molecular fossils was known, people started looking in areas with similar chemistry to the area where the first such find was unearthed. The first such find being Dr. Mary Schweitzer's find of soft tissue in a Tyrannosaurus rex bone. The other thing is that the initial very impressive video of the macroscopic sheet of brown tissue being teased apart with tweezers? Yeah, that's from Mark Armitage. He's not a paleontologist, and I've read his paper on this find many times. It's worthless. He claims that this tissue came from a Triceratops horn, and while it did come from a horn, there's currently no way to know if it was a Triceratops horn. He only took one in-situ picture of the horn, and the associated bones he found with it, which he did not take in-situ pictures of, are more consistent with the identification of the find being a bison than a Triceratops. You might find that hard to believe, but in fact the first Triceratops specimen ever found was originally misidentified as a bison specimen. The two animals had similarly sized and shaped horns so it's really not that hard a mistake to make. Compounding this problem is that Armitage does not give a specific location for his find or a site map, meaning that the find has no provenance, which just like in archaeology, makes the find completely worthless. Further, this paper makes no attempt to justify the assignment of the horn to genus Triceratops, simply boldly asserting that that's what it is. And to add to this, the horn can no longer be examined because it fractured on the way to the lab, but even then, insufficient pictures were taken of it before it was soaked in various acid baths to eat away the bone and rock. Even worse than this, visible contamination from several sources is apparent on what photos there are. Armitage even mentions it. Also, the general area where Armitage allegedly found the bone has both Maastrichtian and Pleistocene deposits, 
known to contain Triceratops hortus and Bison latifrons, respectively. While this is more incompetence than fraud, which I suppose is a step up from Mr. Chadwick from earlier, who one way or another is being dishonest with the data, it is still a display of stunningly bad methodology, which is why anyone even vaguely familiar with paleontology simply dismisses the whole study outright. The whole thing is just garbage from the word go. Many dinosaur bones are even found unfossilized in places like Madagascar, Alaska, and Montana. First, a fossil need not be permineralized, and many permineralized bones actually do have some of the original bone left, but also citation needed, because the only person I've been able to find saying that he found such bones is Buddy Davis, and he has yet to publish on the matter, and it's been a few decades, so I'm not holding my breath. Even the founder of the largest dinosaur museum in the world admitted that usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. Right, because as the soft tissue decays, minerals infill the space left behind. But bone is already basically rock. It's just rock created by a living thing, much like a clamshell. Just look at this soft, pliable dinosaur tissue. This type of bioorganic material has been found in the bones of several different dinosaur species. It sure doesn't look like a 65 million year old rock, does it? No, because it's not. It's a 66 plus million year old molecular fossil. When you step back and look at all this evidence, doesn't it look like the catastrophic worldwide flood described in the Bible that happened just thousands of years ago make better sense of this evidence? Nope, not even a little bit. In fact, in just doing research for this one series of videos, I found more than a dozen journal articles that soundly refute the flood, including two from creationists and several that this video actually used to support its argument. And that's all for the series. Thank you for watching, please remember to hit like, and if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe and remember to hit the bell, and unfortunately, because the YouTube likes to add as many layers as possible between you and my content, if you haven't checked, make sure that you have under the bell all notifications so that way you're actually informed when I have new uploads. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to say a special thank you to my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Jimmy Perry, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, and Henry Hutanen. All of their support helps make this channel possible, and if you'd like to join the team, links to both join the channel as well as the Patreon are down in the description. Tiers start as low as $1, and they get you access to the exclusive patron-only Discord server, as well as early access to almost all of my videos. However, if a monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there are links to my Teespring store, and of course, liking and sharing this video always helps. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur.